All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped, thoroughly furnished for every good work. For the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder the soul and the spirit and the joints from the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the Word of our God shall abide forever. Before we get started this evening, we need to make sure we're in fellowship. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you that we can come together tonight to study your word. We, we thank you for the freedom that we have in this nation, a freedom that is even now being threatened through these actions of the terrorists, a freedom that is even now on the verge of being defended once again because of this uh, possible war with Iraq. Father, we're reminded that throughout the scriptures, we have the demonstration of the principle that freedom comes through military victory. Each generation has to win their own freedom. Each generation has to demonstrate that they have the capacity and the desire to live free. And, Father, this is the test of this generation. Ultimately, the only thing that provides real sustenance in times of crisis is the doctrine that is in our soul. We know that our times, our days are in your hands that you have determined the time, the manner, and place of our death, and that therefore we can just relax and live our lives with uh, energy. We can live our lives with courage because we rest in your provision and in your protection. Father, we pray for those in this congregation who may go in harm's way. We pray for those who have been called up to uh, active duty. We pray for those who are in their families that uh, are behind, who are praying for them, who are taking care of things on the home front, we pray that you would comfort and encourage them and that through this time it will be a tremendous time of spiritual growth and spiritual advance. Father, we pray for us as we study your word now that you would challenge us with these truths, that they may not be simply academic principles, but they might be real truths that encourage us, that give us comfort knowing that you are the God who has spoken, you are the God who has interacted in human history, and you are the God who continues to provide for us and to supply our needs. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this evening we're going to continue our study in Genesis. We're in our third lesson. We've gone, we've taken an overview of Genesis, and last time we looked at the overall book to see what it taught us about God and what it taught us about man. Tonight it's still an overview, and we're going to focus on one particular subject. We're going to answer a question that is the focus of the entire night's message, and that is, who wrote Genesis? Now, some of you are saying, well, Moses wrote Genesis. Let's close in prayer and go home, but it's not quite that that simple. For some of you, the doctrine we covered tonight may seem at times to be a bit technical, And maybe to some of you it might even seem to be irrelevant. You might be tempted to think that since you will never encounter the kind of challenges envisioned in this in this message, that uh, you can sort of take a mental vacation and just uh, go off to some beach somewhere, down some ski slope, or think about how warm your bed's going to be tonight. But let me warn you against that for several reasons. First of all, remember, all doctrine is important to understand, even though all doctrine is not immediately applicable or relevant. It is always relevant at some point and in some way. Remember, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That includes, as we'll see, even the genealogies in Genesis. I can't wait. You're probably thinking, oh, no. But it's amazing the information that is embedded in those genealogies. The second reason that this is important is that this will, at the very least, strengthen your confidence in the Scriptures, that the Scripture is what it claims to be, and that is the Word of God, the revelation of God, God revealing Himself to man, therefore an objective revelation. So this should strengthen your confidence in the historical reliability and veracity of Genesis. Third, you never know when you might need to know this. Now that you're going to learn this information tonight, you may be challenged in the next few weeks, months, or year by somebody, and you're going to fall back on this information. 
So you never know when you might need to know this. You may not be challenged in a university or college classroom uh, with this with this information, but one night you may be channel surfing across the uh, television and run across one of those shows on Discovery Channel, Mysteries of the Bible, or one of the other religious shows where they try to uh, give us information about the Scripture, and you're going to hear something, and you're going to understand what's really going on there because of what you hear tonight. Fourth, Many of you have children or or you will have grandchildren who are going to run into some of this that I talk about tonight in their classroom, either in high school or in college, and your knowledge about this, even if all you remember is, I know that Pastor Dean talked about this at some point, so I'm going to go back and get the tape for them so that I can uh, give them the information, and at least you will be forearmed. Fifth reason we need to study this is our prep school teachers need to be communicating this in prep school classes, especially in the older kids in the category of Christian evidences. And then sixth, we just need to have this on file in the tape library in case somebody needs the information. The first time I ever ran into a challenge on who wrote Genesis, who wrote the Pentateuch, was when I was a freshman in university in 1970 and sitting in a Western Civilization course. And the professor of that course, who later ended up being one of my favorite professors, even though I disagreed with him on a number of things, that he he taught this view that challenged Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. As, and he taught, it, he taught this view as dogmatically as he could. And I had never in my life before heard about a challenge to Mosaic authorship Neither had I heard any of this information that he presented. Consequently, I was not intellectually prepared, and it planted a seed of doubt about the veracity of Genesis. Now, you've got to remember that when I was a freshman in high school, I was reading Henry Morris' stuff on the Genesis flood, so I had a pretty good background in some areas. But I had never heard this before, and he made what sounded to me like a tremendous, a very convincing case that Moses could not have written the Pentateuch, and not only that, the Pentateuch obviously couldn't have been written before about 600 B.C. Now, you think about it, it's 586 B.C. that the Jews go out into uh, the captivity to Babylon, and many liberal uh, theologians take the position that nothing was written prior to the Babylonian captivity. So I had no background. I had no preparation. I was not intellectually fortified to just be able to sit there in the classroom and respond. See, if you're in a classroom and some professor teaches something that challenges the Bible and you don't understand it, it doesn't mean you raise your hand and start challenging the professor. But at least in your own mind, in your own thinking, you need to be counteracting what he's saying, saying, I know different than that. This is what's wrong. This is why it's wrong. You have to think and you have to interact. And if you don't, you need to go get the right information. Now, the challenge to Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch is not simply something that's, that's a, uh, a, a doctrine that, that finds its home only in some sort of ivory-towered university classroom somewhere, but it comes home in, in odd little ways to haunt people. Uh, I mentioned just, just about any movie you see that has to do with biblical themes is going to be um, is going to be advised by somebody who buys into this this theory that I'm talking about tonight. So it, it crops up in different places if you know what you're what you're looking at and you're aware of what you're observing. Furthermore, there was a Dallas Seminary professor some seven or eight years no a little more than that ten or twelve years ago that had been a, a year or two ahead of me in Dallas who came back and taught. And, and did not believe in Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch uh, and was eventually released from his teaching responsibilities. So this is something that is constantly being brought up, and it's a constant challenge to biblical truth. And the reason it's important is if the Bible isn't what it claims to be, if the Pentateuch isn't what it claims to be as the writings of Moses, if we can't trust that, then we can't, How can we be sure we can trust anything else that is covered in Genesis, especially when it comes to the first 11 chapters of Genesis? So it's important to understand this issue. Now let me summarize it. 
the prevailing view in modern liberal scholarship. And by liberals, I mean those who do not believe that the Bible is the God-breathed revelation of himself to man, that the Bible is not an objective revelation of God to man. Liberal view is that the Bible is just a natural product of human ability, and it, instead of being God's revelation to man, it is man's record of his religious experiences. Mosaic authorship is rejected because their presupposition is man is that God just doesn't communicate like this to man. That's their, their hidden assumption. Instead of Mosaic authorship, they believe that the Pentateuch was actually written by a series of authors, multiple authors. And these authors are identified by basically four letters. It's called the JEDP view of the Pentateuch. We'll get into what this refers to in a minute. Sometimes there's more than that, but that's what it that's just the summary, that instead of Moses writing all five books of the Pentateuch, you had at least four different authors, and then some editor or redactor, that's the technical term, comes along several hundred years later and sort of blends all these things together. What's the background on this? Well, up until the 19th century, it was almost universally believed that Moses was the author of Genesis and the Pentateuch. Jews and and Christians both believed that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. But at that time, many trends that had their source in the 17th century and the birth of the Enlightenment came together and culminated in the acceptance of a worldview known as naturalism. In naturalism, you have the view that everything has a natural cause within the creation. God does not speak inside the creation. God is outside the box, and God never speaks in the box. And so everything happens and everything is caused by events in the box. This view developed, really had its origin. The first person to challenge Mosaic authorship was a Jewish rationalist by the name of Spinoza. Following Spinoza, there were several who put forth different views. One man came along at the beginning of the uh, 1700s, and he said, well, you can identify the different backgrounds by looking at the fact that one author prefers to use the title of Elohim for God, and another author prefers to use the name Yahweh for God. So they identified two different sources there. Then, by the end of the 19th, uh, by the end of the 18th century, uh, there was a scholar by the name of Eichhorn, a German scholar, who came along and distinguished two other sources. So you have the J source, which is the writer who prefers the name of Yahweh, uh, J-H-W-H. Then you have the E source for the man who prefers the name of Elohim. Then the D would be the Deuteronomist. This is the guy who's, who primarily puts together Deuteronomy and adds a few other things in some other books. And then you have a priest who comes along and adds more liturgical information, talks more about sacrifices and that sort of stuff, and he adds material later on. Now, the basic motivation, the basic motivation here is to discredit the Bible. They make a basic assumption. They assume, and this is a hidden assumption. They don't take this out. They don't talk about it. But the hidden assumption that they approach all the evidence with is a presupposition of anti-supernaturalism. They assume from the get-go, without any evidence, without any data, that God can't speak to man, that there is no such thing as a miracle, that there's no such thing as the supernatural. This is indicated by a quote I have on the overhead by Miller Burroughs. Burroughs was one of the men, one of the men who worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He was a professor of, uh, at Yale University. And Burroughs said the excessive skepticism of many liberal theologians stems not from a careful evaluation of the available data, but from an enormous predisposition against the supernatural. That's their agenda. They do not believe that God will, could, or can, if he exists, communicate to man. Therefore, when they look at the data, no matter how wonderful the data is, no matter how convincing the data is, they're not convinced because God, uh, by definition, can't, will, cannot, will not, and would not communicate to man. Second, their agenda is to discredit Mosaic authorship because if Moses did not write the Pentateuch, 
and the Bible is not what it claims to be, then they've destroyed the veracity of the early chapters of Genesis, and therefore man's not what the Bible says he is. There's no such thing as God. You have no basis for the atonement. It is an attempt to destroy everything else in the Bible. Now, in the ni- by the late 19th century, there were two theo- German theologians, Karl Graf and then Julius Wellhausen, who came along and popularized this view. Now, at that time, they would say that the J, that the J author wrote about 850, 850 B.C. The E writer wrote about 750. The D writer wrote about 621, and then the priestly writer wrote about 570. But within 20 or 30 years, by the time you get into the 20th century, those dates are all out. And they would just say that everything was written after the Babylonian captivity during the period known as the Second Temple period, after they returned and rebuilt the temple under Zerubbabel. So this becomes the foundation of what becomes known as 19th century Protestant liberalism. It's a rejection of Mosaic authorship and ultimately a rejection of any divine authorship. And it's an attempt to discredit everything in the, in the Bible. Now, I want you to be aware of the fact that, that many people who have written and critiqued their views always point out that, that uh, across the board they rejected, denied, and just ignored archaeological evidence to the contrary. And liberal scholarship has consistently ignored the refutations that have been made available and put in print by conservative scholars, and they have built a theory that today is nothing more than a working hypothesis. But it is the working hypothesis of every liberal theologian, even though the details on which this thing was originally built can no longer be validated. But see, they can't throw the whole theory out because if they do, the only option is what? To believe the Bible. And you'll see tremendous parallels between this and the whole acceptance of evolution. You have the same manufactured evidence. You have the same circular reasoning. You have the same fact that back in a... In the early 19th century or 18th century, you had certain positions developed based on certain uh, conjectures, certain assumptions, certain evidence that they thought was there. That evidence fell apart as a result of archaeological discoveries in the early 20th century, but the conclusions continue to live. And they continue to live, and I was taught this by an uh, extremely educated uh, history professor when I was in college. As a matter of fact, Twelve years after I graduated, I was back in that area with a friend of mine. We looked up this professor. We went over and we had coffee. And I went through all this data with him, and he didn't care. He still held to the same positions. And yet those basic assumptions had been refuted time and time again for at least 50 or 60 years. So arrogance is tenacious, and the rejection of God is tenacious. Umberto Casuda, who is a... Not a believer, but he was a, one of, a major Hebrew scholar of a pre, the previous generation, and he critiqued this view in detail. And in his introduction to his book on, this, on the documentary hypothesis, which is the technical name for this view, he comments that there was not a scholar by the 1920s, there was not a scholar who doubted that the Torah was compiled in the period of the Second Temple. Not a single scholar that doubted this. It, was, it became accepted scholarship. And in many cases, it is still accepted, accepted as absolute truth in the liberal scholarly community. Nevertheless, Casuto comments, It is true that differences of opinion with regard to details were not lacking. One exegete declared that this source was earlier, and another exegete, that source, was earlier. Some attributed a given section or verse to one document and some to another document. Certain scholars divided a section or verse among the sources in one way and others in another way. There were those who broke down the documents themselves into different strata and others who added new sources to those already mentioned and so forth. Nevertheless, even though no two scholars held completely identical views, And though these divergences of opinion betrayed a certain inner weakness in the theory as a whole, yet in regard to the basic principles of the hypothesis, almost all the expositors were agreed. It's almost like, don't confuse us with the evidence, our minds made up, 
we're going to buy the theory even though no two people ever agreed on how you interpret it, any interpreted any of the data. Furthermore, Kenneth Kitch, Kitchen, who is one of the foremost Egyptologists, British Egyptologists on the scene today, writes in his book on the Ancient Orient and the Old Testament. Nowhere in the Ancient Orient is there anything which is definitely known to parallel the elaborate history of fragmentary composition and conflation of Hebrew literature as the documentary hypothesis would postulate. See, what the, what, basically what the theory says is that somebody came along, and you've got this, this account of creation here written by a guy who likes to use the name Jehovah, Yahweh. You've got this other account over here, and it's written by a guy who likes to use the word name Elohim. Then you've got a guy who's really concerned with priestly stuff. And so this redactor sat down, and he just kind of takes out his scalpel, and he cut and pastes from these different documents and puts all of this together. Now, nothing is written that way. And, of course, the assumption is that you can go in and look at this and figure out which part came from what source. Now, that's, it's not the same as the view that most biblical scholars hold, which is that Moses had records in front of him. But he writes a single document. I mean, it's like today when I put together a message for, for tonight. I sit down. I have three or four different books on my desk with different, different resources, different, different information from different authors. Yet I write out the message for tonight, and it is written by one person. I have quotes from different sources, but it is one unified message written by one individual. It's not some crazy quilt that's patched together, which is the liberal view and completely denies Mosaic authorship. So we have to answer this question and demonstrate why it is important to understand that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. So Kitchen goes on to say, Converse, that is, on the other hand, any attempt to apply the criteria of the documentary theorists to ancient Oriental compositions that have known histories but exhibit the same literary phenomena results in manifest absurdities. Okay, we know, sir, we, have, we know the complete history of some old ancient documents. Now, because we know their history, if we were to come in and apply the same approach, the same methodology to understanding the history of that document, it would end up making that document just an absurdity. That's what he's saying. You can't, you can't find any parallel to the modern theory anywhere in the ancient world, and you can't make the modern theory work on anything that we have all the information on. It's just a, a, a theory that's been made up out of thin air. So what, is, what did they bring up as proof? What did they set forth as proof? Well, the first proof that they set forth was that writing wasn't known in Israel in Moses' time. This argument soon fell out of use due to archaeological discoveries. However, in 1970, I was still taught that in a university classroom. Unfortunately, that's not a valid argument. There were discoveries in 1929 at a place called Ugarit, which is in northwest Canaan, up uh, in what is modern, near modern Lebanon today, that dated to the same period as Moses. It was a rich discovery of documents and literature demonstrating that in that area there was uh, a tremendous amount of writing taking place. Now, remember, the Exodus takes place at 14, approximately 1446 B.C. A hundred years after that, we have what is known as the Amarna Correspondence, and that's variously dated from 1350 to about 1250 B.C. And the Amarna Correspondence was letters that were written from people and, and some leaders in the Palestine area as they were writing back to the Egyptian pharaoh and reporting on the circumstances and situation in Palestine. So you have many other evidences, and then in the mid-'70s there was a discovery at a place up in Syria called Ebla. And at Ebla they discovered a rich library in a palace there that, in fact, many of the records of Ebla mention names that were similar to the names found in the Bible. And that dated from a period of about 2100 uh, B.C., some 600 years before Moses. So this, as I said, this theory is based on, 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 on some pillars that 
after about a hundred years, just couldn't hold the water. One of them was that writing wasn't known in Israel in Moses' time. Second, they had an assumption that there were no known law codes that existed as early as the Mosaic Law. Therefore, this was just had to be a fabrication. Nobody had such a technical, detailed law code that early. However, the Code of Hammurabi of Babylon uh, was discovered by archaeologists, and the date there was between 1700 and 2000 B.C., a good three or 400 years before Moses. Furthermore, in Mesopotamia, there was the discovery of what is known as the Lipit Ishtar Code, which dates to about 1800 B.C., 400 years before Mesopotamia. So you have the Code of Hammurabi, the Lipit Ishtar Code, and then there was a small kingdom down in that Mesopotamian area, not too far from modern Kuwait, called the Kingdom of Eshnuna. And in 1945, they discovered an extremely technical law code there written in Akkadian, that dated to about 2200 B.C., or approximately 800 years prior to Moses. So that assumption didn't hold water. Then their next assumption we have to deal with in a little more technical manner. This assumption was that various names for God indicated different authors. Some passages you have Elohim used exclusively. In other passages, Yahweh is used exclusively. So they suppose that that meant that this must indicate different authors. Now, some, here are some of the examples. First of all, and this is important to observe these distinctions, but they don't mean what they think it means. First of all, Elohim, the title for God, the generic term for God that's related to um, uh, just any kind of the general appellation for God is, the, is uh, uh, this title, and this is used exclusively in Genesis 1-1 down through 2-3. Now, I noted last time or the time before we looked at the Toledot sections, and there's a Toledot at the beginning of chapter 2, verse 4. That's translated. This is the history. This is the generation. These, this is what happened to the heavens and the earth. That begins a new section. So 1, 1 to 2, 3 is a, is a complete section, and in that section you do not have any name for God other than Elohim. There's no mention of Yahweh in that section. So they would say, well, Genesis 1 is the writing of the E document, and then starting in 2, 4, you have the phrase, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And the day that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, made the earth and the heavens. So that's the first mention of the name Yahweh. So they would say, okay, starting in 2.4, you have the introduction of Yahweh. So chapter 2 and chapter 3 are written by the, by the Yahwist, by the J, part of the J document. So this, um, this would be their contention. Now, this is a, there's a, just a slight problem here. Now, there are a lot of technical evidences that I could cite. I'm just going to try to cite two or three to give you some, uh, some documentation here. But this, uh, the, the facts don't fit the theory because in Chapter 3, see, they would see 2, 4 down to the end of 3 as being all part of Yahweh because that's the primary term for God used there. But in 3, 1, you have the term Elohim. In three two you have or three three you have the term Elohim, and in three five you have the term Elohim. You do not have Yahweh mentioned there, so obviously that doesn't fit the hypothesis. Then in chapter four you have the name Yahweh occurring several more times until the end of the chapter when all of a sudden Elohim alone is introduced again. So that doesn't fit the scenario. Then when you come to the flood story in chapter six through eight. The names uh, of Yahweh is used sometimes, and then there's a switch to Elohim. So it goes back and forth. That doesn't fit a, the, the theory that they have. And then uh, in Genesis chapter 15, Yahweh occurs when, when God is giving his covenant to, to Abraham. Now that's clearly, Yahweh, remember, is the covenant name for God in the Old Testament for Israel. That is the name always associated with the covenant. So you have Yahweh in Genesis 15, and that would fit the theory. However, in Genesis 17, where God introduces circumcision as the sign of the covenant, the name that we find there is not Yahweh, 
but Elohim. So we have to ask the question. There are clearly changes that take place in the text. But why is this the variation? Why does the author go back and forth between Yahweh and Elohim? I do not believe that these are accidental or haphazard, but that they are there by design and because the, of the purpose of the author. Think about an example. You have the son of a very famous general, and he decides that he will write a biography about his famous father. And dear old dad was always referred to as the general. Now, when the son sits down to write his father's biography, instead of writing one section just on his military career and one section on his family life, he's going to tell the story of the man's life as it actually played out, interweaving the personal dimension with the uh, professional dimension. Now, when he writes sections where he's talking about the military aspect, instead of referring to his father in a more intimate sense, he refers to him as the general because that fits the context. And then maybe in the next paragraph or the next section in that chapter, he's switching to talk about the letters that his father wrote home, or maybe he came home on furlough, and he is playing with him and he ha as, a, as a young child. And so in those sections, he refers to his father in more intimate terms as Papa. Now, it's still the same writer. He's just referring to his father in, with different titles to relate to the different roles the father had at different stages of his life. This is the idea that underlies the shift in names for God. Furthermore, the Jews knew that there was only one God. In 1 Kings 18.39, we have the phrase, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now, the term Lord is Yahweh. Yahweh, he is Elohim. They knew Elohim is a generic term, but Lord is the name of God, the specific technical name of the God who is associated personally with Israel and who has entered into a personal covenant relationship with Israel. So Elohim is the generic term. Elohim is the name that the Gentiles use for God. But Yahweh is a term that is specifically associated with God's relationship to Israel. So we go back and we do an analysis of the use of the terms in Genesis, and you realize, or throughout the Pentateuch, that Elohim was used when the lessons and material focused on God as the transcendent God when the emphasis is on God as a more abstract, distant God, when the focus is on God as the creator of all life, the ruler of all the universe, and the source of life, and, that he, and when his actions are related to all of mankind. And then Yahweh is used when the lessons and the material focused on uh, focus on God as the personal, holy, righteous God when the focus is on the God of Israel who interacts personally in human history, when his specific attributes are in view, when there's an emphasis on his righteousness and his justice, when the text is emphasizing the majesty and glory of God, and when the emphasis is on God as a personal God who enters into concrete relationships with man. So the Genesis 1-1 portrays the transcendent God who's the creator of Jew and Gentile alike. But in Genesis chapter 2, you have the more intimate portrait of God who is creating, who is in the process of creating the man and the woman in his image and likeness and setting forth the ethical demands of the knowledge of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is the God who is intimately involved with people. Furthermore, an analysis of the names of God in the Scriptures reveal that in the prophets, you know, the, major, the minor prophets and the major prophets in Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, Daniel, in uh, Hosea, Amos, Joel, in all of the prophets and in the legal literature, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, in much of the uh, poetry except for what's technically called wisdom literature, Yahweh is used exclusively for God. You don't have Elohim used alone in those passages. It's always used either in conjunction with Yahweh or it's used or it's not used at all. Yet in the wisdom literature like in Job and in Proverbs, Elohim alone is predominant. You have very little mention of Yahweh. 
Now, why is that? Well, if you look at all the ancient Near Eastern literature, Egyptian literature, Babylonian literature, uh, Akkadian literature, per, uh, Persian literature, this was typical. Whenever they were writing about their particular gods, they used the technical name of the god. But when they write their wisdom literature, which are universal principles of life, they would always re use the generic name for God. This is a standard way of writing throughout the ancient world. In Egyptian literature, rather than using the personal name of a god, they would use the generic term uh, neuter, N-U-T-E-R, rather than a specific name. Same thing in, in Babylonian. The term El would be used instead of a specific name like Aruru or Marduk. Not only that, but this type of distinction continues throughout all Talmudic literature and rabbinic literature. In that literature, which specifically focuses on God and his relationship to Israel, they never use the name Elohim. It is always the name uh, Yahweh. So this usage plays out that Elohim is used when the focus is on God and his roles related to all of mankind, and Yahweh when the emphasis is on his his attributes, his, his uh, righteous standard, and his specific relationship to Israel. Some objection to this would be, someone might say, well, look, at the end of Genesis 1, I mean, the creation week in Genesis 2, 1, God establishes the, the seventh day and makes it holy. That's the Sabbath day. Isn't that Jewish? And yet the term God, Elohim, is used in Genesis 2, 2. Yes, but you see, the Sabbath day is set aside and is holy for the entire human race. Remember in Exodus 19, in the Ten Commandments, God says, Remember the Sabbath day and make it holy. All it does at that time is to instantiate the Sabbath day as a sign of the Mosaic Covenant for Israel. But the observance of the Sabbath and its setting apart as a special day has its root in the first um, or in the second chapter of Genesis, where it applies to the entire human race. And then Genesis chapter 2 relates God as personal and righteous. Now, no other ancient Near Eastern text is ever thought to be compiled in this sort of patchwork quilt manner. It's, it's, it's ridiculous to even think about applying this to something sort, such as the Enuma Elish, which was the Mesopotamian cre creation document. We'll look at that in a little more detail in a couple of weeks. In fact, in the Enuma Elish, there are three different deities mentioned that have double names, just as God has the double name of, of Elohim and, and Yahweh. So this is standard operating procedure in ancient Near Eastern literature with a single author. Or, or, or the Gilgamesh epic. Nobody's going to come along and apply this to try to break down the various documents behind the Gilgamesh epic. In fact, the only similar attempt to this that has taken place in what we would call modern scholarship is the attempt made on Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey to chop it up and to try to discover various sources. And the interesting thing is if you go back to the 1600s, they parallel themselves. At the same time that in classical studies they make certain moves on Homer, uh, within the same decade, they're making the same moves on the Bible. So there's a parallel there. But golly, in classic studies, they've thrown this out. They now believe that, that Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, and they believe in a single author, but not when it comes to the Bible. See, the liberal scholarship is still touting the conclusions based on faulty, faulty evidence and faulty data. Furthermore, in the Hadad tablet from Ugarit, Baal, which is a more generic term for the god, and Hadad, a specific name, are used interchangeably in that document. On the Berlin Stila of Ikernofret, the god Osiris is referred to by five different names or appellations. He's referred to as Osiris, Winifer, Ken Amintui, Lord of Abydos, and the generic term for the Egyptian generic term for God, uh, neuter. So here you have in one stela five different names for the same individual, yet no one tries to come along and say, well, this represents five different sources written over a period of four or five hundred different years. In Mesopotamian literature, in the prologue to the Lipit Ishtar laws I mentioned earlier, the god Enlil is also called by the name Nunamnir. 
And then in the prologue to Hammurabi's laws, laws, there's a reference to uh, Ishtar, also called Inanna and Teletum in that document. And then another god, Nintu, is referred to by a second name as well. So this is standard operating procedure. This is how in any document in the ancient world, they all had these same characteristics. They were written by one individual. They would refer to the deities by two or three different names. And they were not composed, this does not indicate that they were composed by multiple authors over many different uh, centuries. So there is no reason, no evidence, that the different names for God in the Bible indicate different authors, different sources, but they are used to bring to bear by one author different emphases about the person and character of God. Now a fourth argument that's used is that there are different styles and different vocabulary in different places which indicate different authors. They place an emphasis on these uh, minor differences, in some cases large differences, in order to say, see, this shows that they're different, different authors. Now one argument that's given is a fairly technical Hebrew um, argument based on the use of two different words. I'm going to write these up on the overhead for you so you can at least follow this. I'm not going to get into the technicalities of it because it will put everybody to sleep, I'm sure. But you have two different phrases. You have the term so-and-so begat somebody else. So-and-so begat somebody else. Now, there's two different ways this word begat is written in Hebrew. The first is using a hyphial stem where it uses a word that is, I'll just transliterate it, holid. This comes from the Greek, I mean from the Hebrew verb yalad. In the um, hyphial stem, you drop the initial Y and add an, uh, a, a hey at the, at the beginning. Then in the cow stem, it looks like this, yalad. Now, in some of the genealogies, you have holid. In other genealogies, you have yalad. And so the documentary uh, hypothesis, the liberal, comes along and says, see, this shows different sources. But it's really a circular argument. For example, in Genesis 4, 1 through 16, you have the name Lord or Yahweh used in the account of Cain versus Abel. And then starting in verse 17, down to the end of the chapter, you have a genealogy. Now, in that genealogy, the, the writer uses the term Yalad. So the documentary hypothesis says, see, you find Yalad here in Genesis 4, so that means that this must be a J word. So wherever we find Yalad, that's a J document. So if it's a J document, it has Yalad in it, and if it has Yalad in it, it must be a J document. See, that's not any different from those of you who study creation evolution. That's not any different from saying, see, the fossil tells us that that rock is, is 200,000 years old. And, and then over here we find that same rock, it's 200,000 years old. So the fossil in it must be 200,000 years old. You can't date the fossil by the rock and then turn around and date the, date the rock by the fossil. You can't determine who authored a section by a verb and then turn around and say, oh, we know that because that verb's here, it must have been written by so-and-so. That's just a circular argument. You haven't established your premise at all. Furthermore, the verb yalad in the cal stem here occurs a number of times with the synonymous meaning of holid, the causative meaning from the hyphial stem in, uh, in passages such as Deuteronomy 32.18, Hosea 5.7, Psalm 2.7 and Proverbs 17.21. So there is an interchangeability between these two words that does not necessitate different authorship. A second argument that they try to use is that two different phrases. One phrase is, the, is um, Hakim Berit. This is the Hebrew word. B-E-R-I-T-H, which is the word for covenant. And in one place you have it with the verb hakim, and in another place you have it with the verb uh, karat, 
which means to cut. Actually, this comes from the verb kum, which means to establish a covenant, to establish or, or, or a covenant or fulfill a covenant, and karat means to make or to cut a covenant. And the liberals come along and say, see, these are synonymous phrases, but there's a difference. Karat merely means to give the security of a contractual agreement, and hakim is used when a covenant or contract is fulfilled, when it is uh, established, when it is uh, actually brought to completion. So if you don't understand the distinction in the idioms or you misinterpret it, then you end up with further problems. Now then this other this next one is one that's a little less technical and one you'll catch a little more easily and that is that the the uh, the liberals make an assumption that that the J document is going to look at God a certain way and in the J documents God always reveals himself in corporeal form so when you find God appearing that's going to be a J document if if God appears in a dream or a vision then that's the Elohim document. That's an E document. And if God just speaks alone without appearing to man or using a dream or vision, then that's a P document. Now, these are hard and fast assumptions that these scholars make. But you see, the theory never fits reality. In Genesis 15:1, we read, After these things, the word of the Lord, and that's Yahweh there, After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abraham in a vision. Well, wait a minute. Only the Elohim guy has God appearing in a vision, but but we have the name Yahweh here, so it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. So Hermann Gunkel, who is one of the big names in o- Old Testament or Hebrew scholarship, a ger- German uh, German scholar, has, makes a very strong case. I mean, it doesn't hold any water in my opinion, but he makes a case that well, the word vision really doesn't belong in the original text. So if you take vision out, you don't. It doesn't contradict their theory. See, don't confuse me with facts. If we got something that doesn't fit the theory, take out our scalpel and change the word of God. Take vision out. Now, if you thought that was fun, let's look at the next one. In Genesis 26:24, the Lord, once again it's Yahweh, the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abram's sake. So here, Yahweh appears at night, but it's Elohim that's supposed to appear at night. So now again, we have another verse that doesn't fit the theory. Okay, well, how do we handle this? Well, in this case, the critics just take the verse out and say it shouldn't be in the Bible at all. And then in Genesis 28:13, we read, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, Now here's the Lord appearing in corporeal form. It's Yahweh who's supposed to appear in corporeal form. So we have, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God, notice just by itself, Elohim, the God of Isaac. Now what the liberal comes along and says, Oh, well, obviously they completed this. so, So you really have two statements, and they will take out their scalpel and cut the verse in two and completely rewrite the verse so that it fits their theory. Now, those are just some examples of what takes place in terms of of, uh, liberal scholarship trying to make the data fit their theory. Same kind of things happen in creation evolution. Then there's another problem, and this is one you'll most likely run into if you run into any of these, and this is somebody claiming that there's two different accounts of creation. Genesis 1 is one account, but there's contradictions with Genesis chapter 2. Now, there's a lot of ways to handle this and to answer this, and the first is that um, that it's typical, it's pretty standard approach of all ancient Near Eastern literature to describe an event in general summary terms and then come back and give the specifics and deal with one element of it in in a more in a more detailed detailed fashion. So it fits the pattern of ancient Near Eastern literature. Now, there's a couple of other little things that they point out. So turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, and we'll look at these. In Genesis chapter 2, we read 2-4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth 
when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, they would say, look, this is in the day when God made everything. Now, he didn't make man until the, the sixth day in chapter 1. So how, how do you make this fit? Well, the phrase here is the Hebrew word ba-yom. Ba is the preposition meaning in, and it's prefixed to yom, the word for day. Now, if it was replacing a definite article, it would be pointed differently. It would be ba-yom. But it's not replacing a definite article, which means that yom is considered to be indefinite, and not in the day, but in a day. Now, whenever you have yom with either a, a number or an article affixed to it, it refers to a 24-hour day. That's one of the reasons those six days in chapter 1 are literal 24-hour days. But furthermore, when you have this phrase, bayom, it's a Hebrew idiom for at that time. And it's used that way in places like Numbers 3.1, Psalm 18.1, and 2 Samuel 22, verse 1. So it reads, in the time that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. It's not talking about the specific day. And then it talks about the fact in verse 5, it says, before any plant of the field was in in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. But didn't God create the plants on the third day, not not on the sixth day, they would argue? Well, it's interesting. If you look at the Hebrew words there that are used for the plant, tziach, and herb etziv, you have the repetition of those ideas, and especially etziv, at the end of Genesis chapter 3. When God tells, uh, in 3.17, God tells Adam, Cursed is the ground for your sake, uh, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. That is tziach. The thorns and the thistles are synonymous to tziach. And you shall eat the herb of the field. See, what's happening in Genesis 2.5 is it isn't saying that there were no plants and no vegetation on the earth, but two specific kinds of vegetation weren't yet present on the earth, and they're not present until after the fall. The reason they're not present is because the fall changes things. And man's food is supplied graciously by God through the fruit of all the trees in the garden. He doesn't have to till the soil to produce vegetables and herbs for food, but he does after the fall. So we have to, that's not a contradiction. Another contradiction they come up with is in Genesis 37, in in some sections, those to whom Joseph's brother sold him into slavery are Ishmaelites, and in other sections they're called Midianites. But the Midianites and Ishmaelites are the same people. So it doesn't indicate different authors. It just indicates that they different terminology is used. So Kenneth Kitchen concludes here that there is no incompatible duplication here at all. Failure to recognize the complementary nature of the subject distinction between a skeleton outline of all creation, like Genesis 1 on the one hand, and the concentration and detail on man and his immediate environment on the other, borders on obscurantism. They're just purposely ignoring the facts. As I said, he is one of the foremost Egyptologists today, and he cites other examples. For example, on the Karnak poetical stela, the god Amun addresses King Tutmos III, Uh, generally at the beginning, and then with more detail. On the Gibel, Barkal, Stila, he says there's a general description of the first part of the the narrative, and then there's the detail of specific triumphs. He also cites numerous royal inscriptions from Urartu, which show the same pattern, an initial summary paragraph followed by a detailed account. Always you have this pattern, general, then specific. Now, the fifth line of evidence that they try to come up with is really based on the assumption of evolution, that monotheism really had not evolved yet by 1450 B.C. See, their assumption is that man, all cultures move from simple to complex, so they assume that polytheism is more simple. Monotheism is much more abstract and technical, so as man got further and further away from his Stone Age background, 
re- his religious ideas evolved until finally he came up with this masterful idea of monotheism. However, once again, that doesn't fit the evidence. There's no straight line development in cultures. Just think about what you know about Egypt. Egypt had various cycles of development in the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdoms. This was mirrored in the Sumerian development, also Babylonian Kingdom. There's no straight line development anywhere. Furthermore, a work that is usually ignored by scholars, written by a Jesuit scholar in the 20s named Wilhelm Schmidt, it's a six-volume work in the French, where he, he was an anthropologist. He investigated every culture, South American, Central American, uh, 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 Oceanic, uh, Asian, Indian, Hindu, whatever. He traced every re- known religious uh, belief system back to a, a rig- an original monotheism. And it's been translated into English and abridged into one volume, which I have read, and it is an incredible documentation that all known world religions, no matter how obscure, all began with a single God. This is exactly what the scriptures teach. However, liberals have an agenda to reject God. The biblical evidence is clear that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, Exodus 17:14. The Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. So it clearly indicates this. There's internal evidence to support this. The writer of the Pentateuch has an intimate knowledge of the customs of that that day, and these customs would not have been known 500 years later. He knew Egypt. He knew the desert. He knew the language. He was intimate with the geographical locations he describes. This would not have been so 500 years or 1,000 years later. Furthermore, he wrote in a second millennium contract form called the Suzerain Vassal Treaty Form that was not known 500 years later. Furthermore, the Pentateuch claims Mosaic authorship in passages like I just showed you, Exodus 17, 14, Exodus 24, 4. Moses wrote all the words of the law. Exodus 34:27. the Lord said to Moses, write these words. Uh, Numbers 33, 1, the writer says, These are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by the armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now Moses wrote down at the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord. And then Deuteronomy 31, 9, so Moses wrote this law. So the Pentateuch claims Mosaic authorship. Furthermore, other Old Testament books taught Mosaic authorship, like Joshua 1, 7, that Be strong and courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Uh, Other passages like 2 Kings 14.6 reference the book of the law of Moses. Daniel 9.11 and 13 reference the law of Moses. Malachi 4.4 references the law of Moses. Not only does the Old Testament teach that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, but Christ taught it in Mark 12.26 that the book referring to Exodus is the book of Moses. And in John 5, 46 and 47, he references Moses as the author of the Pentateuch. So there is clear evidence that from the Old Testament and the New Testament that Moses authored the Pentateuch. Furthermore, the Jews in their tradition believed this. Uh, both the Jews and the Samaritans, the Samaritan Pentateuch be- holds to Mosaic authorship. The Palestinian Talmud holds to Mosaic authorship. Philo, in his work on the life of Moses, says Moses wrote the Pentateuch, and Josephus held to uh, Mosaic authorship. The bottom line is that you must take every verse and claim of Scripture as absolute truth, whether you fully understand it or not. If you pick and choose, and cl- then you make yourself the authority, and in effect, you're judging God. This is the position the liberals have placed them in, themselves in, that they claim to be God and they claim to know what is true and what is not true without any aid from an outside divine source. It is clear that the Bible claims to be exactly what it, claim, what it is and that it is the word of God about the origin of the universe and the creation of mankind. So we can be confident when we come to read the Pentateuch and the early chapters of Genesis, that this is giving us absolute objective truth. With our heads bowed 
and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to study your word this evening. We thank you for the confidence that it gives us as we go back over this evidence, seeing that that everything that you claim in your word is substantiated and supported by corroborating evidence that we know of in the ancient world, and that there's never been anything discovered by archaeology to cast any doubt on the veracity of the Scriptures. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives, the fact that you have given us so much. We pray that we would not treat that lightly, but we would be challenged by your word to put it all into application, that we might glorify you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.